For more than 100 years, communications and signal systems have played a pivotal role in railroad operations. CNS systems have evolved from manual-based methods in the early days to mechanical devices, then to today's electronic systems that are essential for safe and efficient delivery of customers' freight. In this program, we'll take a look at how communications and signal systems have developed through the years. The foundation of any wayside signal system is the track circuit. Early track circuits were DC circuits fed by a primary cell battery on the feed end and a track relay on the opposite end. The theory of the DC circuit was that the rail served as the conductive path between the battery and the relay, with the rail car wheels serving to short out or shunt the circuit and drop the track relay to affect track occupancy. Primary cell batteries were generally located in a concrete encasement or vault sometimes underground. These cells were labor-intensive to maintain as they were non-rechargeable and had to be periodically rebuilt or replaced. Modern batteries are sealed and do not require periodic maintenance, with some batteries being replaced altogether using electronic substitutes. In the early days and up to today's modern-day wayside systems, insulated joints served to define the limits of the track circuit. Early insulated joint designs featured components that would wear out under heavy traffic conditions. Component replacements were labor-intensive and usually required collaboration of CNS and track maintenance crews. Early track circuits had the added challenge of operating through jointed rail. Each joint required a bond wire, which was very vulnerable to damage from dragging equipment, theft, or vandalism. The 1950s saw the first wide-scale deployment of ribbon rail to replace jointed rail. With ribbon rail deployment came development of the glued joint to replace the high maintenance predecessor, insulated joint. Today's glue joints in ribbon rail territory require very little or no maintenance between rail replacement cycles. A fixture of all early wayside signal systems is the wayside pole line. These pole lines carried circuits for several essential functions, including signal control circuits, dispatcher code lines, and AC power. Some pole lines also carried communication circuits needed for VHF radio base stations, telephones, telegraph, and teletype. Pole lines presented formidable maintenance challenges, especially during inclement weather which often resulted in broken poles, cross arms, and line wires. Maintaining the pole lines in remote areas where there were no roads required vehicles that could operate on the rail. For many years, railroads used motor cars, which later were replaced by utility trucks equipped with high rail gear. Beginning in the 1950s, Norfolk Southern began signal system replacement programs that led to the elimination of pole lines. By the 1980s, NS had stepped up this effort and was eliminating hundreds of miles per year, with this being done by installing electronic track circuits and burying cables for code line, switch protection, and AC power. Later, the use of wireless systems and audio overlay equipment eliminated the need for much of the buried cable. As signal pole lines were being eliminated, modernizations in the communications area were similarly done to eliminate communication pole lines. The most prominent example of these modernizations was Norfolk Southern's installation of a private microwave network in the 1960s and 1970s, designed to provide transport of voice and data for VHF radio, code lines, telephones, and fax machines. Today's microwave network on NS has 440 stations, covering almost 8,000 path miles. As the methods of conveying wayside signal aspects have advanced, so have the signals themselves. Over the years, wayside signals have taken many forms. The earliest wayside signals were ball signals, which were later succeeded by banjo signals. After a short time, banjo signals gave way to semaphore signals which became fixtures on most railroads for many years. By the 1950s, many railroads began replacing semaphore signals due to their comparatively high maintenance costs. Depending on railroad preference, semaphore signals were replaced by either searchlight, position light, or color light signals. Color light signals, which have been in use for many years in some areas on NS, 
was established as the standard wayside signal for all of NS over 10 years ago. One of the most critical functions that CNS performs for the railroad is down at highway rail grade crossings where CNS systems warn motorists and pedestrians of oncoming trains. Warning systems have come a long way since the days when crossing watchmen used a handheld stop sign to warn motorists of approaching trains. Later, handheld stop signs were replaced by manually operated gates and lights. The watchmen raised and lowered the gates either manually or electrically from a shelter adjacent to the crossing. The advent of DC track circuits used to detect approaching trains led to a major evolution in warning systems, automatically controlled gates and lights. DC track circuits were replaced by motion detection systems, which included the important timeout feature which permitted the warning devices to deactivate if an oncoming train movement pauses on the crossing approach circuit. The final step in grade crossing circuitry evolution is today's grade crossing predictor units which provide constant warning time to motorists regardless of the speed of an approaching train. In the early years, high-density train movements through congested track configurations involved use of on-the-ground personnel or switch tenders whose task was to manually line switches and use flags as signals for trains to indicate when it was safe to proceed. These manual operations were slow, inefficient, and subject to human error. Non-interlock signals operated by the switch tender represented some improvement, but did not address most of the safety-related vulnerabilities of a manual operation. The first major breakthrough in signal system safety was the development of interlocking systems. The earliest interlockings involved switches and signals that were mechanically operated and locked. Soon, technology advances led to electromechanical designs, followed by electrical or all relay designs that came into use in the late 1920s. All relay interlockings opened the door for use of interlockings that could be remotely controlled by an operator or dispatcher located many hundreds of miles away. Shortly after their introduction, all relay interlockings gained wide acceptance and became the standard that was employed on most railroads for over 50 years. The standard was used until the mid-1980s, at which time solid state systems were introduced. Solid state systems permitted elimination of all but a few of the relays customarily required at an interlocking location. Today, solid state systems are the established standard for wayside signal interlockings and control points. There has been considerable evolution as well in systems and equipment designed to perform inspections of cars and locomotives while moving on the railroad. For most of the railroad history, inspection of rolling stock for defects was performed at yard locations or on line of road by train crews and employees stationed or working at trackside. The most common type of rolling stock defect is an overheated wheel bearing, which is called a hop bearing or hop box. Historically, train crews detected hop boxes by their telltale smoke. The disadvantage to this method of detection was a smoking wheel bearing usually meant that a serious problem existed that required immediate stopping of the train to prevent a derailment. Development of wayside detection systems represented a significant improvement over previous human detection methods. Beginning in the early 1960s, hotbox detection equipment was installed at trackside locations whose function was to measure wheel bearing temperature and indicate an alarm condition if a predetermined heat threshold is exceeded. Early on, notification of alarms to train crews was done from locations such as interlocking towers, dispatch centers, or system-wide warm bearing monitoring centers. When cabooses were eliminated in the early 1980s, synthesized voice capability was added to hotbox systems, enabling heat alarms to be transmitted directly to train crews. Today, Norfolk Southern employs more than 1,000 hotbox detectors, with nearly all augmented with a device to detect Dragon equipment. Dragon equipment detector designs have themselves evolved from early versions which featured breakaway paddles. Also in recent years, NS has installed a number of wheel impact load or wild detector systems at strategic locations, capable of detecting flat wheels and imbalance loads on passing rolling stock. From the beginning, there has been a need for effective and reliable communication between train crews, roadway workers, and dispatchers. In the early days of railroading, before radios were used for communication, railroad workers used wayside telephones, 
or in the case of train crew communications, hand signals. The earliest form of onboard railroad radios were actually telephones, which utilized a wayside pole line as an antenna along with a large roof-mounted antenna on the locomotives and caboose. The advent and widespread use of railroad radios has drastically changed the way that railroad workers perform their jobs, improving safety and efficiency of many routine tasks. Prior to track warrants, movement authorities were by train order delivered to train crews at terminals or on line of road. On line of road, station agents and operators stood beside the tracks and handed train orders up to engineers and conductors as trains passed. Sometimes train orders were placed in stands at trackside that were high enough for train crews to reach. Early on, telegraph was used to transmit train orders to outlying stations, which very often was a slow and tedious process. Later, telegraph was replaced by wireline voice systems that still required line-side operators to copy and deliver train orders. In later years, train orders were delivered directly to trains via voice radio, a practice that continues today, but with the use of track warrant for moving authority instead of train orders. Widespread use of voice radios for transmission of movement and work authorities issued on demand quickly and safely has added tremendous flexibility to railroad operations. In addition to improving safety and operating efficiency, CNS technology has played a key role in improving service to our customers. For example, development of car tracking systems has improved the timeliness and accuracy of car movement information, and at the same time has improved customer billing accuracy. At one time, movement of freight cars was tracked manually, generally by clerks whose job was to write down car numbers on passing trains. In the late 1960s, railroad deployed automatic car identification, or ACI systems, that used optical means to automatically record car initials and numbers on passing trains and transmit that data to a central computer for processing. However, by the late 1970s, problems experienced with consistent reading of car-borne ACI tags resulted in the industry abandoning this technology only to revive the effort a few years later with the deployment of radio frequency identification, or RFID technology. The industry adopted RFID technology in the mid-1980s and coined the term Automatic Equipment Identification, or AEI, to its use. Upon adoption, the industry followed up with an effort to install AEI tags on the entire North American freight car fleet. Today on Norfolk Southern, more than 650 AEI tag readers provide timely car movement information to NS applications and customers. CNS is the heart and soul of modern process control systems employed at NS's hump yards. This has not always been the case. The earliest hump yards utilized hump riders who rode each car down the hump into its assigned class track, utilizing the car's handbrake to slow the car to its required speed. Later, retarders were installed to slow down cars rolling down the hump, with these retarders controlled by a car retarder operator, or CRO, who manually regulated the exit speeds of humped cars. Car stop retarders are another example of where CNS equipment was employed to transform what used to be a totally manual operation. Before the advent of car stop or skate retarders at the exit end of class tracks, yard employees utilized hand skates for this function. These hand skates were manually placed on the rail and were used to stop the car prior to fouling the yard lead. Application of hand skates was very labor intensive as it required manual placement prior to humping and manual removal prior to pulling on the track. On Norfolk Southern, sophisticated computer control systems are now employed at all hump yards. These systems are integrated with remote control locomotives and other systems to maximize safety and efficiency of the humping operation. Today we try to capture the tremendous evolution in CNS systems to constantly improve safety and efficiency for railroad operations. This evolution has been driven by technological changes and a continuous focus on improvement. Undoubtedly, many more innovations and improvements will come in future years. At Norfolk Southern, we will always be looking for ways to improve railroad operations in the way we perform our tasks.